Hello and welcome to Third Thursday, live from the Allentown Art Museum. My name is Abby and I'm the Adult and College Program Coordinator here and the host for this evening. Tonight we'll be celebrating color and complexity, 30 years at Durham Prep. This exhibition is now on view and will be open until September 20th. To kick off tonight, we're going to show a video from the Durham Press Studios, exploring some of the processes and materials used by the artists to make these stunning works. Afterwards, we'll do a live tour and see a closer look at some of the unique prints you see in the section.
Up next, we have Elaine Mihalakis, Vice President of Curatorial Affairs, here to lead an interactive tour. Elaine is a specialist in modern and contemporary print and curator of this exhibition. She is also the author of the Color and Complexity Catalog, available at the museum store or online at allentownartmuseum.org. This tour is designed to be interactive, so we encourage you to post your questions or comments into the chat. With that, I'll hand it over to you, Elaine. Thank you, Abby. Burn Press is a uniquely innovative and experimental printmaking workshop. They collaborate with artists around the world. They're based in a renovated 19th century old house in Clark County, Pennsylvania. But their work is collected by institutions and individuals internationally. Durham Press was founded in 1988 by John Paul Russell. John Paul Russell's early career started in New York City in the mid 1980s as a teenager when he made prints with Rupert Stacey Smith for Andy Warhol. Through that experience, he learned that printmaking had an incredible potential for creative exploration, not just for reproductive, um, not just for reproduction. Um, John Paul Russell and his wife and business partner, Ann Marshall, have been running the press for the last 30 years. And this exhibition uh, gives a sampling of the work over about those three decades. Durham Press is especially known for their unique large scale masterpieces of print making, as well as their portfolios and monitors. Have a collection of all of these works. One of the first works that they published was this edition of 21 prints by Michael Heiser, a land artist who makes earthworks out of um, large scale rock and uh, land moving operations. These prints um, are quite unusual in terms of their scale and the incredible three dimensional quality that they have. Like all of the prints that Durham Press makes, this is a result of a true collaboration in which the artist and the staff at the press, most particularly John Paul Russell, um, work together to figure out a way to make the artist's vision possible. Um, sometimes this is through using um, techniques that are uh, quite common to printmaking, like screen printing, wood cut, uh, etching, or lithography. Um, but oftentimes it's using really unorthodox techniques like you see here. So these prints were published in 1992. They're called Offering One, and these are die embossed, die saturated screen prints. Um, these prints were made through an interesting process where initially they screen printed um, areas of the print. It's on an extremely thick paper that you can see um, if you come up close and look at the side in particular. Um, after the screen printing, they were soaked in water. The very thick paper was soaked in water. And then it was molded around um, a, an armature of wood blocks to create a three-dimensional form that you see. And these relate to um, stone tools and the um, materials that the artist uses in his earthwork as well. Um, once the um, paper was molded around the form, then they used staples, um, some 500 staples for each of these works. Um, and they stapled the, the paper in place and allowed it to dry. And once it dried, you had this three-dimensional form. Um, at that point, they took the prints, they flipped them on their face, and the artist Michael Heiser took some dyes, aniline dyes, and began pouring them into the back of the print. Um, so fascinatingly, these prints are kind of a combination of really structured and consistent um, 
screen printing that you can see repeated um, through each of, each of these variant impressions, um, combined with this kind of uh, method that incorporated the process. So you would pour these dyes, dyes would mix and warm in unexpected ways. And in fact, he was doing this somewhat blindly because he was pouring from the back. Um, this process is one of the things that makes me think um, of Durham Press's work as both meticulous and irreverent. Meticulous in that they're very exacting in what they do, they're excellent at the quality of the registration and the uh, printmaking itself is incredibly um, strong and high quality. At the same time, they're willing to absolutely try anything. Um, this was quite an ambitious project that it took over three years to produce um, and involved several trips to the artist's studio in Garden Valley, Nevada. Um, and one of the interesting things that um, I also like to point out is that at this very early stage in the life of the press, um, they were doing something so ambitious and um, unorthodox. And not only were they doing the printmaking and investing and believing in the artists with whom they work, they were also the publishers of these pieces, which is unusual for um, a business to take on both sides of that. So not only did they um, invest the time and the uh, energy into creating the work with these artists with whom they in whom they believe, but they also um, were the ones that put up the, the backing, the financial backing to make these possible, and they're the ones that get these prints out into the world as well. Um, one quick question about these works. Um, you said that he's a land artist, but I think it's really interesting that he swapped over to print, and there's this beautiful juxtaposition of Earth tones and these really bright jewel tones. Do you know if that's common in other works by Michael Heiser? Um, well, you can see another work by Heiser, a very recent work over here. Um, and so this is really much more of the earth tone. Um, but so I think this is a particularly colorful project that he did. Um, and, you know, all the artists who work at Durham Press. Their practice incorporates um, different media and really the work that they do at the press, um, in a sense, allows them to experiment in a way that pushes their work in other media forward. So it's very kind of integral, it becomes very integral to what they do, um, their overall practice as an artist. In 1996, uh, Brazilian artist Mercedes Melhavez had her first solo exhibition in New York. Um, and at that point, Jonathan uh, Russell and Amy Russell met the artist. Um, and they began an important ongoing collaborative relationship. Melhavez had in 1989 developed a process um, in her painting that was a collage like process. She would start with um, a drawing on a piece of plastic. She would then build up layers of paint on the back of it and then glue the painted uh, surface to her um, canvas. And in this way she would transfer the image. And so of course we have this um, similarity to the transfer that occurred uh, with printing. But more importantly, this collage-like process that she used really lent itself to an understanding of how um, a complex layered print would work when you develop um, layers of paint, particularly um, as you can see in these prints here. Um, when she first started working with Durham Press, she worked with 
exclusively with screen print, and this is one of the earliest prints that we did with the press over here. Um, and one of the techniques that the print that the press developed um, allowed her to work similarly and intuitively and in a way that was flexible, much like her collage process. So she could take an element and move it around and change her composition easily within the, the process of designing the print. Um, and you can see in this image that there's a very smooth finish to it. The green print tends to be a, um, a sort of shiny and very flat kind of texture. Um, and this was actually unlike what she was doing in other media. And because she had an expectation of tactile quality to her artwork, um, John Paul Russell in 2006 recommended to her that she try experimenting with wood cut um, on Japanese paper in addition to green print. Um, and so this was really a turning point. And Figa or Fig from 2007 is uh, one of the prints that reflects this change in process and this experimentation. Um, incredibly, this is a print that took 109 months to repress. So when we talk about printmaking, um, we can think about something as simple as an ink stamp where you're just transferring that stamp to the paper. That's a print of the most simple kind. But then you can get a complex with something like this or other projects that John Park does where um, you know, the amount of time and the layering and the complexity of the image is um, really equal to the idea. Um, so this is a combination of an image of screen print and woodcut and the screen print notice as well, similar to the print that we looked at before, has this kind of shiny surface in contrast to the kind of more matte surface of the um, woodcut. Um, so for this, they used 12 wood blocks um, that were printed in one order, moved around, printed again, and then moved around and printed a third um, and then they used actually some sound um, Indian textile blocks um, used to print fabric. So these floral areas here, um, there's some 50 impressions of that wood block that get repeated through the print. And all of that um, wood block was really just the basis for the image. And after that, they did some um, 40 or 50 layers. So really an incredible tour de force. Lindsay, we do have a question from the chat. Um, someone wants to know, how did she register her print, um, especially to have so many layers? Um, well, that is what the expertise at Durham Press was really able to do. Um, they, um, they would, of course, very carefully plan this. Um, and, uh, I can't speak really any more detail than that. Um, but um, that's their expertise, and that's why the artists go to them because not only you know, are they you know, creative collaborators, but they have the knowledge and skill that um, you, know, you couldn't get anywhere else. Um, and you can see just the even like embossment, which has added to the pattern and to the textility of the paint. Oh, so many layers, and that means there are, there are layers that were put down that we don't see now. Well, you can see um, that some, you can see the overlap in some areas where color um, comes through, another transparent or translucent color. Um, yes, I think there are areas that I mean, where there's a more opaque kind of use of screen print where you're not seeing everything happening beneath there. But it's all part of the makeup of the final image. Um, so Mel Hazard is continuing to work with Durham Press 
and it's sort of a mutual admiration between um, her and and John Paul, who um, speaks about her as a woman who really deeply understands the aging process. Um, and from her perspective, she has talked about how um, the experimentation at Stone Press really allowed her to make strides in other areas of her work as well. Another very unusual project um, by James McNair, who's a British born artist now based in New York. Um, he's a painter and filmmaker, and he's really renowned for his massive brushstroke painting. Um, this print over here is um, an example of what this image is looked like as I made through the screen printing process, in which the image is kind of broken down and rebuilt through several screens um, to get this kind of flawless. Um, but the project I wanted to talk about in particular is this 2013 project called Road Paint Print. And these are literally made of a road stretching machine. So those machines that you see out um, painting the roads uh, so that we don't kind of cross over lines are the, uh, is the exact thing that was used to make these. So he has started working with the road painting when um, making paintings, so he would run this machine over um, a linen surface. Um, and then he thought, well, wouldn't it be fun and what could we do if I got together with John Paul and we thought about making prints with this machine. So he brought what he called the Little Dragon to Durham Press. And um, you actually saw in the video that we just showed some images of them working outside with that large machine um, that kind of melts together the paint and these reflective elements. Um, and so they worked out a process where they could um, put a sheet of resin down, they would run the machine over it to create um, a line. And then they would take the resin sheet and they would um, they would etch that, um, or they would rather they would create a, a mold out of that, um, and then that could be um, carefully hand um, inked and um, and then printed. And part of the reason for coming up with that process was that he really wanted there to be this heavy thick texture to the line much like he had in the painting that he did. And you can see the real uh, thickness and depth of that, um, that ink uh, on the surface of the paper. And the paper itself is actually screen printed black before they print the, the white and kind of reflective Colin Applebaum is an artist who wasn't sure that printmaking was for her. Um, but she, she came to Durham Press in 2015. Um, and in working with John Paul and Anne uh, and the staff at Durham Press, they developed a way, well, they developed a trust and they developed a way to facilitate her work in print so that process really um, was similar to a process that she might use in her own studio, much like the existing has here. Um, so one of the things that they did was um, to, first of all, carve, hand carve wood blocks in these floral shapes. 
And by this time, 2002, um, the Soro forms, which were in part inspired by Andy Warhol's flower prints, um, had really become important to her uh, visual language. Um, and she had been making drawings of these flowers and she had been photographing them, large scale Polaroids um, in different um, configurations. And then she had began creating what she called her fallen paintings, which were these installations in which the um, floral drawings now in these lusty dyed pieces of fabric were intuitively placed on the floor. So this process that Durham Press developed um, allowed her to work in a similarly intuitive way. Um, the the um, staff of the press would um, line up all of these blocks and they would paint them in different colors. Um, and so once they had the color scheme um, and the block paint, um, then the artist could come in and they have a large scale sheet of paper like the one you see here for a print like this although she did work in a variety of different scales. Um, and then she could just take the blocks and place them on her paper um, and create this composition. Uh, and then they would run it through the hydraulic press and they would create these monoprints. So this is the only version um, of this print. This is not a print that was printed in an edition. Um, and I particularly love this one in the series because it has these wonderful acidic colors that kind of contrast with the more bright uh, floral forms. And this is a print that's actually been in the museum collection since 2006, which is the year that she made it. Um, and it's a nice reminder of the long relationship that the museum and the press have had. And again, this is another situation where um, the artist really um, has integrated printmaking now into her work in various media. Um, and the collaborative process has become something very special to her, um, even though the work that she does more generally in her studio is um, very independent and individual. Beautiful gradient among the colors here, which is surprising because I yeah, believe you said she does woodblock gradient. I imagine woodblocks are very have very hard edges, but the gradient is so lovely on these. How would they accomplish something like that? So these are also woodblocks, but they use a rainbow roll technique, which is a technique that um, they use to apply the ink to the block themselves. So they're actually combining the ink on the woodblock itself before it gets printed. Um, but it has this wonderful sort of aura about it. Um, and it gets this kind of very kind of, you get this very strange perspective, especially with the size of this um, and this sort of distortion of perspective that you get from the effect. But yeah, much softer, less hard edge effect than any other types of wood block that she uses. So we can get to one other question for the Jane engineers, but if you mind, you can circle back to right sure. So someone um, someone wanted to know they asked if if they had just used black paper instead of green printing white paper black, would that have affected the texture that we see here? That's a great question. Um, I suspect that the, um, the oil-based ink that they would have used to do the screen printing would set up almost like a barrier that, you know, if you printed directly onto the paper, it might absorb more of the ink and you'd have less of this effect of the white ink sitting on top of the surface. Wonderful. It's almost crucial to create the depth of, of the white that you see. Mm -hmm.
and Elaine, one more question. Does Polly still do prints like the ones we just saw? The flower prints. He does, in fact. Uh, they're printing um, a new uh, group of work by her currently at the press, um, which are based more on uh, Pennsylvania Dutch uh, symbols, actually. Um, she has a series of hearts um, that are really wonderful. So yeah, she she's continuing to work with the press, and she has kind of this um, language of symbol that she works with, um, and we have three of them on the slide here. But, um, she tends to return to it. Uh, this is a portfolio now moving to some really recent work published by the press. This is from 2018, and this is by an artist named Victor Bennett, who um, is also a filmmaker. Um, and this is called Children. It's a portfolio of 27 linoleum cut prints. So these are being from, uh, printed from a car block of linoleum. So it's a relief printing process. Um, and this portfolio was inspired by um, a story called Sultanism, which was written by an Indian female author, a feminist author, and a social reformer and activist, um, and written in 1905, actually. Um, and yet it's this kind of very topical portfolio. Um, it deals with issues like um, sanctuaries for refugees and stewardship of the environment um, and education for women. Um, and of course, these are subjects that we've been thinking so much about today, particularly as we move into the political season. This is just a sampling of what you can see in this exhibition. And we're very excited to be reopening the museum tomorrow to the public. So um, you can have the opportunity to come in and see this exhibition and the museum in person for yourself. Um, so we're going to give you a, a little tour around some of the things that um, I didn't talk about in depth. And um, thank you all for tuning in.
thank you all for joining us for the live tour. I hope you enjoyed seeing some of the beautiful work in this exhibition. And thank you, Elaine, for taking us through and giving us some of your insightful notes on this wonderful exhibition. Up next, we have Mike from Boardroom Spirits, who's going to give us a demonstration on how to make the Woodstock-inspired Purple Haze cocktail. I'll pass it over to you, Mike. All right, there we go. How's everybody doing? As she said, my name's Mike from Boardroom Spirits. We're talking about our Purple Haze cocktail, Jimi Hendrix inspired for Woodstock week from uh, WXPN, our good friends. So basically it's a grapefruit mixed berry and vodka sour is the uh, style of cocktail. So I'm gonna show you an easy way to make that up and then a little bit more of an enhanced version. Now, most people don't have fancy bar equipment. Uh, basically, we're looking for a little more than half a glass of wine. So I like to use this, just fill that up twice. Got some ice, just a few cubes. And then you take your shaker, Give it about 10 to 15 seconds. And watch this. Perfection. That's what you want right there. That's gonna be properly diluted nice icy tart drink now if you want to impress your friends while you're video chatting here's a new version add some strawberries lying around throw in a couple fresh strawberries grab a bar spoon or whatever's near and just try to mash that up a little bit Here's where it gets crazy. That's right, raw egg. The alcohol and the citrus actually, while shaking it, cook the egg and turn it into a fizz. If you're a vegan, a vegetarian, non-egg eater, actually chick ju chickpea juice, also known as aquafaba, works just as well to give this foam that we're going for. So I crack this. and remove the yolk just like that. And same idea here, 15 seconds. That gets the egg a little bit, a little bit started there and then you get your drink in there. The initial shake breaks up the egg and starts emulsifying it and now this will transform into a fizz. So you could call this one the strawberry purple fizz. And I can, uh, can show you, 
that nice layer of foam on there really adds quite a bit to the drink. Well, that's all folks. And I hope you enjoy our RTDs and keep having fun and keep doing a good job with the art museum. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mike. I would have never ever have dreamed to put an egg in a drink. That was pretty cool. Um, next up, we're gonna do some trivia. So I'm going to pass it on to Brett, who is gonna be the host of our trivia tonight. All yours, Brett. Hey, Amanda, thanks so much. Let me uh, get the screen up for everyone to see and welcome everyone to the second annual digital only uh, social distancing trivia presented by the Allenton Art Museum. Um, real quickly, I'm gonna go through a couple rules and, and practices as we get started. Um, and then once we, once we have that out of the way, I will we'll, we'll get right into it. So, one second. All right, so uh, welcome everyone to the Allenton Art Museum's, uh, like I said, second annual social distancing digital trivia. Um, this is something that we do every third Thursday, so I, I thank everyone who's here and attending and, and highly encourage uh, anyone who, who is interested in this kind of thing to come back with us uh, next month as we do the same thing. Um, some rules for, for the evening to get out of the way just to, to make the process easier. Um, the way you're going to be responding to questions as we go through them is going to be via chat over to the uh, right on my screen, it's wherever your chat is, though. Um, so as a quick test, I'm going to ask my co-host, uh, who you just heard speaking, uh, Amanda, to, we're going to do a test run, and I'm going to ask everyone a simple question, and I just want you to reply in chat, and you're going to send that chat to all panelists, not all panelists and attendees. Uh, the reason for that is if you send it to all panelists and attendees, you're giving your right answer to everyone else and thus stopping your chance at winning. Um, and what do we have for a prize today? It's a $30 Amazon gift card. So I highly encourage everyone to be competitive, um, you know, think through your answers and, and do your best. So to test the, the question answering system, if everyone can please in chat, send Amanda the answer to the following question. What is your favorite color? And we will keep an eye on chat to make sure everyone's coming through. It looks like we've got about uh, eight or nine people still participating in trivia. So I'm going to look for eight to nine answers and we'll, we'll go from there. Awesome. I see some answers trickling in. I've got about four so far. I'm going to give it another minute. Let's get some other people in here and make sure everybody's ready to go. Uh, but so far, it looks like everybody's getting it right. I haven't seen one go to everybody yet. So, so good job, everybody who's participating. All right. All right. So it looks like I've got answers from everyone. Amanda, can you just confirm you're seeing those answers on your end as well so that we can, we can get things moving? Yep. Yeah, I see everyone's answers. Okay, perfect. I see one person missed the question. So the first question uh, is just what's your favorite color to test out uh, the, the question answering process. But because that, an that, that response came through all panelists, I'm, I'm sure you got it right. There it is. Perfect. So with that all out of the way, rules clear to everyone, let's get started with Allentown Art Museum's third Thursday trivia. And today's focus is on printmaking and the printing process. So hopefully we've got some artists and art experts on, uh, on the line with us today as we make our way through. And question number one, round one. All right, in 2007, Calibri replaced what font as the default in Microsoft Office's Word? So in 2007, Calibri replaced what font as the default in Microsoft Office Word? Oh, I already see some answers coming over and we've got a mixture. So there's some disagreement while I, uh, while I 
wait for some more answers to come in and let you guys think this one through. Fun fact, uh, font is actually a relatively recent word to be colloquialized as the term to describe different types of text and uh, formatting. Originally, font was used just to describe the size of the text and typeface, which is still used in marketing and a lot of graphic design, was meant to describe the style. Um, obviously, that's changed and there's a lot of variation now, but it's still a um, still something to consider if you're in those spaces in an interesting way that, that language evolves. All right, I see some answers coming over. I've got one, two, three, four, five. I think we're waiting on one or two more. Uh, Amanda, are you seeing these on your end as well? Yes, if I could just unmute myself. And yes, <laughs> I, I am seeing the answers. We are still missing a few answers from some participants. So. All right, so we'll, we'll give it another, another. we'll say 10 seconds. And after that, if, if you don't have it in, we'll, we'll call it a miss. Um, okay. But yeah, no, no worries. And and again, everybody on the on the line, I, I know you can hear me and I can't hear you, but I'm just going to assume that everyone is is following along, excited, smiling and enjoying themselves as I talk to myself. And we move to the answer for question number one. In 2007, Calibri replaced what font as the default in Microsoft Office Word? The answer was Times New Roman. Um, and looking at the chat, it looks like we've got two, two right answers. So two teams making their way up into, into the lead right off the bat. Again, question one, we got a lot of time to go. Uh, to the rest of you, I, I see some answers that I, I might have put myself, but now you know, Times New Roman. Question number two. This artist was the first to work with Durham Press after the studio opened in 1988. Below is an example of work created by the artist and Jean-Paul Russell, founder of Durham Press. Retrospect 1989 screen prints. Who is the artist? Well, I see some excited answers already coming over and they all are in agreement. So either those first three excited answers were very right or very excited to be wrong. And I guess we'll find out. Ooh, more people agreeing. I feel like there's a, it's a positive sign when everybody's on the same team. At least if the ship goes down, you all went down together. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. I think we're waiting on one or two more. And as I said, we'll give it another four or five seconds. And the answer is this artist who first to work with Durham Press when it opened in 1988 is in fact, Keith Herring, and it looks like across the board that one was answered correctly. So to everyone who sent in an answer, great job. Um, and good job recognizing, recognizing good art as we move to question number three. What was the first book printed using a movable type printing press? So what was the first book printed using a movable type printing press? All right, I see two answers and then a lot of thoughts. So remember, if you're answering, you're going to send that to all panelists in the chat. Um, I got two answers so far, and I've got a couple more of you guys to go. Ooh, and a very specific answer came through, which is which is exciting. So I don't know if we want to give uh, uh, maybe a half point there for tie breaking. I'll, I'll let Amanda decide that as she's keeping score on her end. I like that idea. That was a go. very specific answer. Yeah, I see it. And then, and then uh, I see another answer here that is not an answer, but just deep sorrow. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say that is not the right answer, but the frowny face is conveyed to me. I feel for you as I tell the answer. What was the first book printed using a movable type printing press? It was the Gutenberg Bible. And I got Bible from a, a big chunk of people, but one person did know it was the Gutenberg Bible specifically. So that's, that's pretty impressive. Um, maybe you are an amateur printmaker yourself or just enjoy printing books, but good job. As we move to question number four, which is the last question of round one. Question four. What is the name for the dot that appears over the lowercase letter I? So 
yes to all of you whose minds are now blown that dot does have a name and i invite you all to desperately grasp at what it might be except for those of you who are maybe again typeface and, and font experts and Ooh, I see, I see two spellings of a similar word and two frowny faces. So <laughs> we're, uh, we're making progress, I think, for some of you and, and for others, maybe progressing somewhere, somewhere worse. So hopefully the next question will, will return the, the smile that, that we saw before. Ooh, I like that answer too. I don't think it's going to be, uh, I, I don't think that one's going to be the right one, but I will, I will highlight that one as, as my favorite answer. Uh, when I give the answer, and it is, what is the name for the dot that appears over the lowercase i? It is a tittle, a tittle, and I see, uh, I see it spelled two ways. I think we can give points to both people who got that one right there. Um, and and my favorite answer of all the answers was Dotty. So if if that's not its official name, that is officially its nickname in my household. And with that said, we've made our way through the first four questions of trivia. As we move into question five, I'm going to pause for a minute. Amanda, can you let us know who we've got in the lead so far? Um, Irene. All right, we have a tie between Ooh. Irene and Nicole. All right, Irene and Nicole, you've now eyed your rival in, in chat. You, you can see their name. You know who you're up against. So just send all of the... Uh, the negative thought energy you can to, to <laughs> deny them answers as you make your way forward. Cause I'm, I'm pretty confident this is, this is going to be the round that breaks that tie. Question number five, in what year was the 19th amendment passed giving women the right to vote? In what year was the 19th amendment passed giving women the right to vote? All right, I see some answers trickling in. And I think that is everyone. Yep, so in what year was the 19th Amendment passed giving women the right to vote? That was 1920. 2020 marks 100 years of women's suffrage. Um, so it's a, it's a year to celebrate to everyone who wasn't aware. And it looks like all of you were very, very, very close. So. I'm not sure if the tie has been broken as we move into question six. Round two, question six. Oh, I was wrong. Round two starts after question five. So here we go. Rembrandt Van Rijn was a master painter, draftsman, and printmaker of the Dutch Golden Age. What type of printing technique did he use for this work? Was it A, engraving, B, etching? C, aquatint, or D, a colograph? Again, Rembrandt, master painter, draftsman, and printmaker, did what type of printmaking technique? Was it A, engraving, B, etching, C, aquatint, or D, colograph? Ooh, I see several answers, and it looks like we've got a couple different, uh, a couple different ideas here as what it might be. So this could be the thing that, that splits the group up. As we see, it was etching, B. And I think that we, oh, we have two people who got that one right. I can't remember who was in a tie, but as we move into question seven, I think you guys might still be next to each other. Question seven. Although the release date has changed over the course of the year, what live action Disney remake of their 1998 box hit will debut on Disney Plus September 4th? Although the release date has changed over the course of the year, what live action Disney remake of their 1998 box hit will debut? on Disney Plus September 4th. So this is exciting for me because I am a big Disney fan 
and I am not a reliable printmaking fan. So I probably would only have gotten about this one right so far. So everyone has beat me in this tournament. And I don't know if that makes you guys feel better, but it definitely makes me feel worse as we go into the answer for question seven, which it looks like everyone's getting right. The Disney movie live action remake of Mulan premieres in September. So if, uh, if you are a Disney fan, I've been waiting for that soon you will have your chance to socially distance watch it from the comfort of your own couch question number eight what is the name for the small handheld rubber roller used to spread printing ink evenly on a surface before printing so again what is the name for the small handheld rubber roller used to spread printing ink evenly on a surface before printing. And I see one answer so far from a person who I'm very confident has a lot of art and printmaking experience. I'm not sure if it's an unfair advantage necessarily, but I'm pretty confident there. <laughs> and I see someone who is answering using a part of the question I, I want to give you a, a quarter credit or half credit for that, um, but but small handheld rubber roller is in fact one of the names you could use for this. That's what we chose to use for the question. But the right answer to question number eight is in fact a brayer. So a brayer or brayer roller is the name of that device. And I see two people got that one right. They are different than where we've been so far. So things are shaken up. Everybody better watch out because someone might take the lead after question nine. Number nine, what chip brand once combined inkjet printing with food coloring to print trivia questions, much like the ones you're now engaging in at Third Thursday on their chips. What chip brand once combined inkjet printing with food coloring to print trivia questioning or questions on their chips? And the answers have started coming in. Ooh, and people, I guess, were, were into this fad and buying these, uh, these chips at this time because we got some right answers coming over. All right, give it another couple seconds. And the answer to question number nine, the chip brand once combined inkjet printing with food coloring to print trivia questions on their chips is in fact Pringles. Pringles was the brand. And, and here's a, uh, a fun fact for you guys again, just because I'm, I'm full of these and I, I don't have a lot of people to share them with right now. So you guys get to, get to be victims of my fun facts. So if you look at the bottom of the Pringles can shown here, it actually says potato crisps. The reason for that is that the process that they make Pringles requires them to effectively cook and mash the potatoes and then reshape them into the crispy little potato crisps that we enjoy so much. Um, but because of that, they were not allowed to call themselves chips for marketing. And there was a, there was a lawsuit, I think, um, years and years and years ago, where they, they ended up settling on Potato Crisp as an acceptable name. And if you ever see that label on any other brand of chips, that's why. So take that to, to the next Third Thursday trivia. Maybe it'll be on there. Question number 10. And it's a multiple choice. So some of you who maybe aren't performing the best right now have a, a one and four chance at getting this one right for sure. In 1975, IBM produced the first commercial laser printer. How much did this innovative technology cost at the time? So 1975, you, uh, you head up to your local technology store that has you know, very few options and you see a, a massive commercial laser printer that's available to be purchased. How much do you imagine that cost at the time? Was it A, $800, B, $7,500, C, $12,000, or D, $17,000? All right, I see answers coming in and I see a lot of variety here which means that some of you are right and the rest of you are mostly wrong as we find out. In 1975, the first commercial printer released by IBM 
retailed for seventeen thousand dollars. Seventeen thousand dollars. So for uh, for those who are saving up to buy something unique and, and nice for for the house, you know, maybe an IBM commercial printer from nineteen seventy. Um, it's a great talking piece, and you can probably you know, get a lot of use out of it. Round three. Amanda, I'm going to turn it back to you. Who do we have in the lead now? Is it still a tie, or has one person made their way ahead? It is still a tie between <sighs> Dream and Nicole, but Jackie is very close behind. So they All right. Out. But yes, I do. I want to give some bonus points to someone for their originality in their <laughs> <laughs> answers, though. But we did not do that. But anyway. Okay. That's that's. that's now. <laughs> That, that's fair. I appreciate the honesty, Amanda. I know that some of these answers here are worth prizes of their own. Um, and so some of you I know in the chat, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll come see you at some point when we're allowed to meet again and just give you a, you know, a high five or a, the, the social distancing equivalent for the awesome answers we're seeing because they are not right, but they are very good. <laughs> As we move through round three, first question being question 11. Beatriz Milhaes or, Mil, Milhaes or Milhaes? Milhaes. Beatriz Milhaes is an internationally renowned artist known for her colorful, abstract paintings and prints. Milhaes' first began experimenting with printmaking at Durham Press. Where is Milhaes' from? And this one was in the tour, and I believe it was mentioned in the tour as well. So this, uh, if you get this one wrong, well, no one will know but us. But somebody could be mad if we told, so don't. I see some answers trickling in. We got three, I think, so far. So I got a couple more of you guys that I need answers from. Beatrice Milhazes is an international renowned artist known for her colorful abstract paintings and prints. Where is she from? All right, going to give it a couple more seconds. And the answer is, Beatrice Milhazes is from Brazil. Brazil, that is the answer. And I think that we had uh, everyone who, who submitted an answer got that one right. I think we might have been missing an answer, or I'm not positive there, though. But good job, everyone, for listening to the tour. Or maybe you knew it. Maybe you didn't even need the tour. To, to, it was just a reminder. Um, I think there's some smart people on here. Question 12. In chess... Castling is a unique move that allows you to move what two pieces simultaneously. You see, I feel like all of these non-art questions were geared specifically for me. I'm also a big chess fan. Um, so if you get this one wrong, you only have to deal with my excruciating judgment. What's the answer to in chess? Castling is a unique move that allows you to move what two pieces simultaneously. All right, we're gonna give it another minute. See if we've got some, some stragglers coming in, but I think this one is the one that I would have gotten right. And several other people. Oh no, a couple, I see, I see, I see some other people maybe here play chess and one person doesn't. Two people maybe don't. No, let's see. All right, in chess, castling is a unique move that allows you to move what two pieces simultaneously. The answer is the rook and the king. So then there's pictures for those of you who don't know your chess piece names, but I think everyone here does. So rook and king, and for those of you who desperately want you know, some chess tactics and information, I'm going to go ahead and give it to you, like it or not. Uh, the way it works is you can swap the place of your rook and king, moving your king typically two spaces towards the rook and then moving the rook to the outside now where the king was before. Uh, the rules for this are you can't be moving through a check. So if there are other pieces that would be blocking the path, the idea is that that king needs to be able to move safely every square along the way. And the rook and king can't have moved for the game uh, thus far. So usually you try to do that by, by round 10. So there's your advanced chess tactics that you desperately needed and have as you go about your life moving into question 13. 
in 1983, Chuck Hull invented stereolithography. Stereolithography. Got that one right. First try. Which is more commonly called what? In 1983, Chuck Hull invented stereolithography. Commonly called among us regular people, what? Mm, I see some answers coming over the degree, so I didn't know that, if that's the answer. Interesting. Oh, and now I have someone who disagrees with those answers, so I'm back to being confused. All right, going to give it a couple more seconds. Get your answers in. Can't give you guys too long. I know you have the internet at your fingertips. Question number 13. In 1983, Chuck Hole invented stereolithography. And the common people in the common tongue call stereolithography... 3D printing, 3D printing, stereolithography. I'm going to stick to 3D printing unless I want to impress my friends. So maybe I'm just using stereolithography from now on. I think that's the way it's going to be. Question 14. Which Christmas carol is sung to an extract from a piece of music composed by Felix Mendelisson to celebrate Gutenberg's printing press? Is it A, Silent Night, B, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, C, Joy to the World, or D, Away in a Manger? Which Christmas carol is sung to an extract from a piece of music composed by Felix Mendelssohn to celebrate Gutenberg's printing press? A, Silent Night. B, Hark, the Herald Angels Sing. C, Joy to the World. Or D, Away in a Manger. Going to give it a couple more seconds. That's a tough one, but it's multiple choice, so I can't give you too long. And answers are coming in, and they are different from each person, which is a good sign for me. It means you guys are finally breaking apart this tie that we were, we were very close to. As we go to the answer, question number 14 is... B, hark, the herald angels sing. So I think we got a, a couple right answers there. And I, oh, I'm worried. I think that actually might keep the tie where it was. We will find out soon after question number 15. What type of printing is commonly used in t-shirt making? So for those of you who are home, you know, you're, you're sitting, it's a late Friday night and you're just like, man, I really want to make myself a t-shirt. You're going to go down your basement to your machine that does this kind of printing or to this device that you use for your, your normal printing that's in your basement, and you're going to make your t-shirt doing what? What type of printing is commonly used to make a t-shirt? And the answer, oh, and I, I see another specific one, and I don't know if we can give bonus points for that specific answer, but I will leave it to Amanda to decide if that's, if that's the route we need to go. But the answer to question 15 is screen printing. Screen printing. So I think everyone got that one. Uh, it's like you guys all work in an arts community and know a lot about the arts world, and it's, it's impressive. I, I don't know most of these. Sarah, I think I might have gotten this one if I had some of you on my team. And question number 16, we'll start round four, but before we get there, Amanda, are we still sitting at a tie? No, um, we are not. Nicole is in the lead, but following very close behind is Jay. Jay came up and is now right behind Nicole. So better watch out. Behind. Better watch out, Nicole. When you've got momentum like Jay has from round one to round four, he's not slowing down. You've been progressing at a steady pace, but Jay, I'm confident, could take the win on this one. And round four is the time to do it as we double point value. That's right. Every question in round four is worth two points, unless you're Nicole, and then it'll only worth one and a half. Just kidding. I'm not allowed to make rules like that. They told me beforehand. Round four, question one. 
16, according to the National Social Security Administration, what were the top baby names of 2018? The boy's top name begins with an L, which sounds a lot like a hint, not that any of you need that. And the girl's top name begins with an E. So what were the official top baby names according to the Social Security Administration for 2018? It's just been told to me by a, by a secret executive that I work with within this space that I can give a point for each correct answer here. So think of all the babies you met in 2018 and what names were pretty common among them. You know, you're out at a bar, you're, you're going down the street, you bump into a little baby and it's like, hey dude, what's your name? Ah, I was muted and talking to myself, apologies. So uh, Liam and Emma are the answer to question number 16, Liam and Emma. And for those, I think one of the, uh, one of the participants I see here put an Emily and Liam, and it's not exactly Emma, but I think it's pretty close. So I will leave it to Amanda to decide if we maybe wanna give a half point there just to keep things interesting, uh, which a half point in round four is one point. So I'm, I'm being very generous if Amanda decides to do that. As we move to question number, 17. Silver car crash, double disaster. The most expensive print ever to be sold at auction was purchased for $105.4 million in 2013. Who is the artist? Again, silver car crash or double disaster, the most expensive print ever to be sold at auction was purchased for $105.4 million in 2013. Who is the artist? All right, I see answers coming in and strong desires to cheat going out as we see the answer to 17, silver car crash, double disaster, $105.4 million for this print produced and made by Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol, famous pop artist, did a print that sold for, for more money than, I mean, yeah, any other print ever. And, and I think than a lot of us might ever see for anything we make. Although I'm working on a t-shirt in the basement using that printing press I was talking about. And I don't know. It's going to be pretty cool when it's done. <laughs> As we move to question number 18. True or false? Only male mosquitoes bite. True or false? Only male mosquitoes bite. Ooh, answers coming in quick. Some very, very confident uh, entomologists out there studying their, their insects and knowing exactly what to do here. True or false, only male mosquitoes bite. Going to give it a couple more seconds. I see answers coming through quickly. And they look like they're all in agreement. So we are either, uh, uh, ooh, and now they're not. One person decides to separate from the crowd. Question 18, true or false, only male mosquitoes bite is false. However, it is the females 
who are the only ones who bite. So if you're ever out and and uh, you you're, you're walking and you see you know a mosquito fly by, land on you, and and, and take a little bite, it's uh, it's definitely a female. So they, need the they to make eggs. because they need the protein to make eggs. I don't know if you can hear my my counterpart over here, but now we know why too. So just a lot of fun facts as you're you know desperately trying to avoid mosquito bites, you know, to make you feel really good about yourself. And hey, if you get bit by a mosquito, you're kind of helping create life in the long run. Um, maybe not what you were after with more mosquitoes, but something. So when you, when life gives you lemons. Question number 19, which of the following printing methods fall under the umbrella of relief printing? Again, which of the following printing methods fall under the ca umbrella category of relief printing? printing? Is it A, a line of cut, B, dry point, C, a screen print, or D, an etching? So put your answers over. You can type it out or A, B, or C, or D, and we will see how this goes. All right, and while you're thinking about that, I think 20 is our last question for the evening. So I'm gonna ask Amanda again, can we get an updated tally on who's in the lead and where points stand? Because this next one will be the deal breaker, the tie breaker, the thing that decides who walks away with $30 Amazon gift card presented by the Allentown Art Museum's third Thursday trivia night. So Amanda. Okay, hold on, I'm sorry. Um, you have to give me another second. So no, no I, rush. I see, I see answers still coming in. Take your time. No, no worries. This is, this Keep is my fault. Trying to update here. <laughs> so which of the following printing methods fall under the umbrella of relief printing? Is it a, a lino cut, B, a dry point, C, a screen print, or D, an etching? And the answer is A, a lino cut. Is it lino cut or lino cut? Lino cut. So that was confirmed. I was saying it right. Um, any, any of you in the chat who was judging me and thinking I did it wrong, I got it right, like <laughs> usual. All right, Amanda, do we have an update? We want to go to question 20 and then, and then just announce it. Okay. Irene is in the running. She is in the lead, I should say. And... Jay is closely behind, <laughs> and Nicole, I think, yeah, Jay and Nicole are tied, um, and Irene is in the lead. Wow, so Jay and Nicole, who were in fierce combat at the beginning of this <laughs> round, have both been surpassed by Irene, and now there's just no telling who is going to come out ahead after this question 20. In July of 2007, what book in the Harry Potter series broke the world record for the largest initial print run in history at 12 million copies? 12 million copies. That's right. Only 10 times less than the Warhol pay, uh, print from a couple questions ago. 12 million copies of this Harry Potter book were produced in 2007 in July. Which book was it? And answers have begun coming in. Is this going to be the one that breaks the tie and changes the world? Potentially. All right, I see answers in and the final answer to question number 20 july 2007 this harry potter book broke the world record for most initial printing at 12 million copies was harry potter and the deathly hollows book seven harry potter and the deathly hollows so with that said i see several people in agreement here i'm not sure if this keeps things where they were or changes everything and I will turn it over to Amanda to let us know. And if we need to, we do have a tiebreaker question and I'll explain how that works if we need it. All right, so Irene is still in the lead by one point and Jay and Nicole are still tied. 
Great All right, Irene. <laughs> All right, Amanda, we know what that means. Irene, congratulations. You are the winner of Third Thursday Trivia. Thank you for being here, participating, and winning. We needed someone to do it, and I'm glad you volunteered. To the rest of you, next time, got to study up. Think a lot about your, your art information. Prepare yourself. Come in and take that win. It was very close race. At this point, I'm going to pass things back over to Miss Abby Simmons, Director of Programming for College and Adult Programming. Sorry, uh, a College Adult Program Coordinator, and she's going to take us out. So thanks again for participating with me. It was great hanging out with you all. I'm out. Hello, everybody. I just wanted to hop on and say thank you one more time for joining us tonight. Uh, we really appreciate you all being here. Um, and I wanted to say one more time, put a big plug in. We are opening. Our grand opening is tomorrow, Friday. Please join us sometime this weekend. Reserve your tickets online at allentownartmuseum.org. Um, and visit us anytime Friday or Saturday, 11 to six, or Sunday, 11 to four. Um, Saturday, we'll have a piano player in the galleries, and then Sunday, we'll also have our outdoor art ventures, weather permitting, as long as it doesn't rain. Thank you all again for joining us. Don't forget to come and visit the museum and come and see Color and Complexity before it closes on September 20th. And before I go, one last thank you to everyone who contributed to tonight to make it a success. We'll see you guys next time.